All right, so we're going to get this started on uh, the next section. That is uh, section 3.2. And the title of this section is the Sieve of Orthogonies. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, and uh, this algorithm or this method of actually determining all the primes, as we're going to see, uh, less than or equal a given uh, number. Okay, so in other words, if you are given n to be equal 1000, then you can find all the primes using this SIF method uh, to find all the primes less than or equal to 1000. All right, so the objectives of this section, besides actually introducing the SIF of data Denise uh, algorithm, uh, we're going to start by stating two related but different, actually, problems concerning a natural number n, right? This has something to do with this, of course. And then we're going to introduce the SIFT uh, algorithm. And then we're going to prove that, present actually uh, two proofs, that there are infinitely many primes. One of these proofs goes back to Euclid, and it appears in his elements, all right? And Last, we will be giving an upper bound estimate for the nth prime in the sequence of primes when it is listed in its natural order. All right, so let's uh, get started with the first objective, uh, and that is this prop, these two problems. Okay, suppose we are given a natural number n bigger than 1. So let me write it down. So uh, two options given n bigger than one, a natural number. The first problem is, number one, we need to determine whether n is prime or composite. Second problem. If n is composite, how we can and we find the prime factorization? In some sense, you could think of actually both of these problems are kind of all the same. Uh, in other words, if we have a method that allows us to determine whether you know a number is a prime or not, then we can use the same method actually to do the factorization or obtain the prime factorization of n. And the uh, Method comes actually it comes combined is which we call it the trial division. Okay, so there is a method, a method that can be used to solve both. Problems namely the trial, we call it 
division. Alright, so what is the trial actually division? Let me call it algorithm. Once it's a method, then it takes as an it's an algorithm, it takes as in its input the natural number n. Alright, and the output is gonna say that this natural number is a prime and it's gonna stop. And if not, if it's composite, then it should produce the prime factors, all right, of n. Well, let's set run, you know, and see how this actually algorithm works, all right. Uh, in its most primitive form, all right, suppose we are given n, again bigger than 1, So the trial measurement algorithm is it start like this. Alright. So we are given n other than one. Then step one uh, we divide n by all the natural numbers one, two, three, up to n. All right? So we're going to divide n by each one of these natural numbers. Okay? Step two. If the only divisors of n are 1 and 2, these are the only numbers in this list that divides n evenly, these are the only one, then n is a prime. And we stop. Step three. Again, I'm not writing this in a very formal way. It's really much less than even close to that. Okay? But this kind of the, the idea is if there is A natural number A between N and 1 bigger than 1 less than M that divides N then and is composite and we can proceed and we proceed to uh, the next step okay we proceed uh, to step uh, four Okay. Right, let's see what step four. So we have uh, since A divides N, this implies N is going to be equal to uh, actually A multiplied by n over a. In other words, this is the other integral that's going to be involved. All right? And we have, of course, 
the n over a we call this is uh, because this is a m all right uh, this is n over a this is going to be less than n all right and it could be actually bigger than or equal to one actually it's going to be also less uh, bigger than one because we assume that uh, the a is uh, less than n bigger than one all right then we repeat this process okay and we go back and go to step number one and repeat till we uh, and this process is going to terminate because we are obtaining a decreasing sequence of these natural numbers then we apply the same steps from one to four, actually to three, to the new natural number The process must end. Since the uh, we produce a decreasing chain. Or the descending chain, so now we call it the decreasing chain of natural numbers. And it must end. So it, 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 it actually it ends when we have a prime that you know in, in, in this chain and then we produce actually the prime factorization if the number itself is not a prime from the very first step all right now uh, this method it actually as i said it actually solves both the problems and uh, probably for most people this is the only way that actually the could think of if determining whether a number is a prime or not and produce the prime factorization for it. And in fact, there are many other what is called the primality testing or primality tests that does not use this trial division. Okay. And they only can prove some number is in fact a prime or composite, all right, without, and this method will not give you, a, you know, a prime, uh, the factorization or a prime factorization of the number itself, all right. So there are some, what we call primality tests that only can determine if a number is a prime or composite without revealing you know, if the number is composite, what are the, uh, you know, the prime factors of this number. Now, this method we can improve through the uh, trial uh, division algorithm. In two ways. The first way is we uh, so the one one is we can only divide n 
by primes less than or equal equal to n. But instead of using all the natural numbers from 1 to n, in here we only use the primes that are less than or equal to n. Now let's see why this actually, you know, if, if we do this, then uh, we we don't need to basically use all the uh, all the natural numbers, all right? So let's assume that uh, if m is actually a natural number that is between one and n, so you could say less than or equal to this. Divides, divides n. All right. Of course, if p is a prime, we are done. I mean, we don't need to take any action because this is a prime. We then we are done. If m itself is composite, then we have shown that M has a prime factor as a prime factor let's say p. Then this is what we have. Then uh, we have p divides m and m divides n. Of course this implies that p divides n. So what does this mean? This means that uh, among all the natural numbers all right, that are not primes, all right, then the prime factors actually will actually divide n, and if I only use those, then I find actually all what we need, all right, to determine whether actually n is a prime or not. Of course, if n if, if, if is a prime, then we are not going to find actually any n composite, uh, that actually would actually work, all right? Uh, well, but in fact, in fact, in order to do this, if, if it is a prime, we're really going to be listing uh, only the, uh, you know, the prime factors, or uh, so that divides it, or just only the primes up to, uh, or less than or equal to it. All right, what is the other thing that we can do is not to go all the way actually to n, all right? So the second, we can only test primes that are less than or equal the square root of that. Okay, so this is the second thing we can do to improve the uh, the trial division algorithm. So the second is to restrict the division of n by primes less than or equal to well, to the square root of that. But we're going to state this is in a form of a theorem. 
that simply say that uh, if n is a composite, composite natural number, then n has a prime factor p that does not exceed, is going to be less than or equal to the square root of n. Okay, so let me write this there, which actually answers this question. So this is a theorem. Say that if n is composite, is a composite number, then n as a prime factor that does not exceed prime factor, let me call it p and does not exceed square root of that. Simply means that is is p is going to be less than or equal to square root of that. All right. Here's our proof. Well, we know that n is composite, okay? So since n is composite, this implies n is equal to a, b, where a and b are bigger than 1 and both this than n. All right, without this of generality, let's assume that A is less than or equal to B. In fact, well, it could equal to B, but it's also possible this is less than. We're going to take this inequality, multiply this inequality. by A. So this implies that A squared this and A is positive, it's bigger than 1, is then A B and this is equal of course to N. Alright? And this implies by taking the square root that A is less than or equal to square root of N. All right. Now, if A is a prime, then we are done. I mean, we found, you know, a prime factor that is actually does not exist. So this one says that N has a prime factor that does not. Then we are done. However, if A is not a prime, however, if A is not a prime, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, A has a prime factor that 
let's say B. Then we have B divides A and A divides N and this implies of course B is a divider of N. Moreover, The P is actually less than or equal to A. Actually, it can't be equal to A because uh, it is less than, strictly less than A, and A is less than or equal to square root of A. And we are done. So we found the prime factor that is smaller than or equal to the square root of A. All right. Now, uh, to go back to uh, the trial division. So we said one of the improvement is to divide by all the primes less than or equal to n. The question is how can we generate all the primes less than or equal to n? Alright? We write this down. So here's the question. that remains is how to generate or make a list or make a list of all times less than or equal to square root of n. That's all that we need in the trial division algorithm. for this. Well, a method was given by Orthotopenes, okay, of Syria. He was lived in the period between 276 to 194 BC, all right, and now it is called the chef of Orthotopenes, and here it is, okay. The uh, set of Archimedes gives such a list. All right, so how does this actually work? It's a very simple, very uh, actually very well known, still in existence, and I will give you, you know, some of the disadvantages of this method. It's very, it's very, very simple. Unfortunately, it is not the complexity of it. What is called the space complexity of it. This is a technical term in computer science. All right, uh, it's not efficient. All right, so how this works? All right, uh, step one, okay, so this method, uh, the, the set of uh, these it is algorithm.
First step one, we're going to make a less of all numbers. So if you have all, what does this do? This gives all primes less than or equal a given natural number. So in other words, let's say you wanted to find the primes that all the primes that are less than or equal 10,000. Okay? So the method or the algorithm states, we're going to make a list of all the numbers, okay? Or the, of course, natural numbers, less than or equal to 10,000. Let me just use n, okay? So it's going to be listed as one, two, three, and so on, up to n. Of course, you could make this less in a table rather than in a linear list if the number is, is very big. The second step is to stay, strike out, we're going to skip one, okay? So we're going to skip one when it is actually neither composite or, uh, you know, actually uh, prime. I know actually we don't even have to list this, but just to make it easier, we say we're going to list all the, uh, the, you know, the numbers. So we're going to strike out all multiples of two except two except from the list. For example, to just give a working example in here, let's say I wanted to find the primes that are less than or equal to 20, okay? Because I don't want to make the list is too big. In the fixed book, you could find an example up to 100, I think. And let me put this is on the side in here. So the 20, I'm going to have one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twelve. And so in step number one, we're gonna strike all multiples of two except to itself. So we're gonna strike all those that have Let's write quite a bit of these. Second step, we strike all the multiples of the next number that is was not struck. Okay, again, this one we're gonna circle out. Okay, so we're gonna strike out all the multiples on the multiples of the unstriped number in the list except the number itself in the left except the number itself so in this case the number that is unstriped that first number that is unstriped you know in this list is a three okay so i'm going to put this is a uh, and we're going to see this is a prime, and then we are not going to strike any test. So any multiples of three, as you can see, this means we're going to strike six again, nine again, all right, 
and 15. I'm going to be strike one more time. 18. And this is it. Okay? Then we gotta repeat actually step number two. Repeat step two until we reach a number, the unstriped number that is less than or equal to square root of n. Okay? to uh, reach a number, unstriped number, an unstriped number that is bigger than the square root of that. All right, in our case, we have the square root of 20, okay, is actually less than 5, which means once we do for the 5, the fourth truth, then we can see, uh, strike all multiples of 5 except 5 itself, we don't have anything to strike, then the remaining unstriped numbers in the left would be actually the prime. Okay, so we repeat this 50, uh, until we reach this and we stop. The unstriped number in the list are the primes less than or equal to it. So in our case, of course, to it. All right. Now we're going to move into Talking some questions concerning the sequence of primes. Actually, we're gonna start, you know, this question in, in this section, and we're gonna continue, you know, actually throughout the course, talking about the primes and different properties of primes and and so on. All right. So the first question is, are there finitely many or infinitely many primes? Well, from our experience, we know there exist very, very large primes, but that does not prove that uh, the list of primes or the primes is as well an infinite sequence, if there are infinitely many. It was proved by Euclid, as I said in, in, in uh, his elements, that there are infinitely many primes. So this theorem is referred as Euclid's again theorem. Euclid's uh, theorem. On uh, and, and I'll just throw it Euclid's, okay? Because there are many theorems referred to as Euclid's theorem. One of them is actually if a prime divides a product of two numbers, then it must divide one of them. So let me just call Euclid's uh, uh, theorem. Okay, which states that uh, there are infinitely many primes.
And the proof given here, the first proof we're going to give actually is Euclid proof. And it's one of the nicest actually proofs that proves there are infinitely many parts. There are many, many, all right, proofs given to, uh, to this uh, proposition or this theorem. And I'm going to be presenting a couple of these. All right. Uh, the proof is by contradiction. So we can assume that there are only a finite number of a prime. Let's say B1, B2, and we're going to assume that these are listed in an increasing order of magnitude. Okay, so B1, these are the distinct, okay, the primes B3 and so on, up to Bn, where N is a finite, a finite natural. Now we're going to define a U number say let me see what I want to call this number uh, let me call this number actually Q and it is the product of all the primes that we are assuming exist, and there's nothing else beside these, and we're going to add one to this. Definitely, a Q cannot be any one of these, right? So clearly, the Q is bigger than any one of these. For the least thing is they are all multiplied and they are all bigger than one and we are adding one to this, okay? So this implies that the Q is in fact is a composite number is a composite number. And the reason for that is because this is all the primes and the Q is not one of them. Since P1 up to Pn are all the primes just by our assumption, right? All the primes that exist, supposedly, all right, all the times that exist, and the Q does not equal any one of them. Now, by the previous theorem, or you could use actually the uh, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, because the fundamental theorem of arithmetic has nothing to do with how many primes are there. Okay, it said that any natural number can be written as a product of primes. It doesn't say that you know the prime must be there or must be infinitely many. Okay, so. By the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, all right, the Q has a prime factor 
which this implies there exists a P sub I, okay, in this list such that P sub I divides the Q. We have one other divisibility that P sub I divides the product all the P's. We also have B sub I divides B1, B2 up to Bn. Because P sub I is one of them, all right? Because we could actually write all of this as you know, a multiple of the P sub I, all right? Now, let's see what, what we have. So, P sub I divides Q, and P sub I divides all of these, then it divides a combination of these. This implies that P sub I divides combination of uh, Q and B sub 1, B sub 2, up to B sub n. The combination I have in mind is the Q, 1 times the Q, minus B1, B2, up to B n. So let me write this down in one place. So this implies that P sub R is going to divide, uh, divide the Q minus P1, B2, up to Pn. But what does this difference equal to? Well, the Q is all the product plus 1 minus the product P1 up to Pn. And this difference is equal to 1. Okay, so this difference is equal to 1. Well, this means that Pi divides 1. Well, this is a contradiction because Pi is a prime. It's not equal to 1. It is bigger than 1. So this divisibility is not... Okay, so this is a contradiction since... B pi is bigger than one since it is a prime. By the definition. All right, so everything we have to be done in this proof is legitimate, except actually assuming that there are finitely many primes. Okay, so the number of primes there are is uh, is infinite. All right. Now, uh, let's move on. We're going to define a new types of numbers called Euclid numbers as follows. Okay? Let, here's definition. Let P be a prime number again the left B with bound sign to be this is equal to the product of all primes less than or equal to n. So this one is, this is equal to the product of all primes less than or equal to p.
then a number of this form p plus 1 is called a Euclid number. And the name is, is appropriate because basically this is what the argument that Euclid actually uh, used. He took the product of all primes, actually, except we assume that there are finitely many, and then he took the product of this and added one. And here is just a modification of that because we're taking this B bound as the product of all the primes and then we add one to it. So let's look at some examples. So if we take if P is equal to P, then P bound is equal to all the primes, the product of all the primes. that are less than or equal to 30. And then the Euclid number associated with this is this, which is going to be all this product that I'm going to leave multiplying this to you to determine, you know, the Euclid number associated with this part, plus one. So for every prime, we can associate with it a Euclid number, according to this rule. All right? Now, the question is, are there any of Euclid's number are there are actually prime? Because we looked in the previous proof and we found the Q, all right, actually is not one of the primes that are in this product. But the question is, are there any Euclid number that are primes or are there any that are composite? Okay, so here is the, uh, the question. Okay, we write it down. Actually, this is the problem that, uh, or the question. Are there, there infinitely many? Many Euclid. That is Euclid number that are problems. Or actually, we put it in a different way. Uh, right, right. Uh, or this is equivalent to say, are there infinitely many, many primes? B such that the Euclid number associated with this P, which is this, is a prime. Believe it or not, this is actually an unsolved problem. This one is unsolved. We all know if there are infinitely many problems. For example, if you list some of the Euclid number associated with two, this is going to be three, which is a prime. The uh, three 
plus 1. Remember that this is 3 means it is 2 times 3 plus 1. And this is 7, also a prime. And you can list more. Now, it is known that uh, all in this list, all the, let me list actually, some of the known primes. So here are known Uh, Euclid primes. All right. The two, of course, the three, five, seven, eleven, uh, thirteen, thirty-one. So there are some skipping in here. The three seventy-nine, and there are very few. The largest. Known Euclid prime was discovered in, according to the book, uh, two thousand one. Two thousand one. And the prime that actually produces this uh, Euclid's prime is this, this prime. It's not very big of a prime itself. But the piece, this one plus one. Now remember this P bound between all the primes that are less than or equal to this. All of them multiply adding one, but this has uh, 169,966 uh, digits. This is a huge number, okay? Has no name whatsoever. Look how many digits it has, all right? As you can see, still we don't know if this is going to end, means we have a largest okay, Euclid number, or actually there are infinite limits. All right, since Euclid, uh, since uh, this proof uh, there are infinitely many prime is so simple, okay? There are many, as I said, proofs. And here is another proof of there are infinitely many primes, okay? Another proof for the, that there are There are infinitely many many problems. All right. In this approach, we're going to start with the first prime. That's why, in some sense, it is similar. Okay. So we're going to start with n one equal to two. Actually, we're going to define a sequence, basically. I'm going to define a sequence of natural numbers as follows. So we're going to start with n1 equal to N2 is going to be N1 plus 1, and we're going to define uh, 
n3, this is actually n1, n2 plus 1, n4, will be n1, n2, n3 plus 1, and so on. Alright? So in general, we are defining n sub k basically to be n1, n2, up to n k minus 1, plus 1 for every k bigger than or equal to, would it be say uh, 20 equal to 2? Alright, and taking this to be the initial value. Alright? Now, uh, clearly, nk, of course, is bigger than 1 for every k. Alright? And uh, actually, this is even true for the initial value, for every k bigger than or equal to 1. Alright? And uh, one other thing, so by the, uh, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, Either n k is a prime, or n sub k is has a prime factor, right? Either this, a, you know, this, or it's a prime. The prime means this one n k has at least. One prime factor. And actually, uh, if, if it's a power of a prime, then of course it would be just one uh, prime factor. Or I claim that uh, if P is Here is the claim. claim. If P is a prime factor of NK, then P cannot divide in I for any for any in I that does, oh, let me just say I for any I that does not equal to that. All right. Another way to state this that this is equivalently we can say there are no no two terms in the sequence, in the sequence that we define, we define have the same prime factor. And this includes even if one or both of them are primes, okay? Meaning they're going to be distinct primes if both of them are primes. All right? We're going to prove this claim, and we're going to assume that uh, the greatest common divisor are these equal to D and prove that actually it's equal to 1. So let's assume that. The greatest common divisor of n sub k, n sub i is equal to d, where we are assuming that i does not equal to k. So two distinct, all right, uh, terms in the sequence. Now, uh, without the sort of generality also, let's assume that. Uh, 
actually the which one? One assume I is strictly this tangent because they are not equal to one must be smaller than the other. All right, let's look at uh, uh, since the D is a greatest common divisor, so we have D divides N I and D divides N sub K. And we're gonna work out this. What does it mean for D to divide? All right. So this means that. Uh, D is going to divide Remember what is uh, N sub I means? So this implies that D divides N sub I is equal N1, N2, and so on up to n i minus 1 plus 1. All right? Because that's what n sub i is. And uh, at the same time, because the i we are assuming it is, since i is less than k, all right? Uh, Right, right, okay, one other thing. Okay, so I'm going to have that one up to, to here, all right? We also have, so D divides N sub K implies D divides N1, N2, up to N sub K plus 1. But, since I is less than K, all right? then D divides in 1 into up to NK plus 1 can be written this way. D divides in 1 into up to in I, in I plus 1, and we continue in this up to NK. Let's put between parentheses in here. All right. So the first i and keep going till we reach k are going to be in uh, this list. All right, because it goes up to k. Then we can say that actually d divides the combination of these, right? Linear combination of these. So this thing, which linear combination we're going to take. So this implies so this implies uh, D divides actually uh, in K alright minus because it divides uh, the Is in here. Actually, in K minus uh, that all these in in one. Actually, in I. Let me put here. Uh, This one, one thing is actually is wrong. This one is supposed to be in k minus 1. I'm sorry. This one is supposed to be in k minus 1. All right? Let me make correction in here. In k minus 1. Same thing in here. Because in k is the product of the, the one less than. And one more here. In minus 1 plus 1. All right. So this means that uh, in D divides in K minus in I, and this is equal to uh, N1 into da 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 up to N K minus one plus one. All right, minus 
n1 into up to n i minus 1 plus 1. And, uh, uh, okay. Okay, yeah, I think uh, there's a well, mistake in here. Let me, let me, let's me fix this. Let me start from the following in here. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, so we have, uh, we say that D is the greatest common divisor of Ni in K, and we are assuming that I is less than K. So this means that D is going to divide n i, and this implies that d divides n one into up to n i, and I could add more to this up to n k minus one. Okay, because there is an n i in here, and once d divides that, it divides. You know, you could put other factors. We also have from here that D divides N sub K. This means that D divides a combination of these. So D divides combination of uh, N1 up to NI, NI plus 1 up to NK minus 1, and NK. And the combination, I'm going to be subtracting these out, okay? So this means that D is going to divide. Actually, the, uh, let me put, in, put this in uh, an order, NK minus all of this. NI, NI plus 1. And actually, this is going to go to NK minus 1. But this difference is equal to 1. Because nk is equal to all of this, okay, plus 1. So when you take the difference, you're going to get 1. Well, this means that d divides 1, and hence d must equal to 1. So the greatest common divisor of these is equal to 1, which means that uh, they don't have any common prime facts, all right? So no common prime facts. Well, with this, then each one of these, right? So this implies that the greatest common divisor of n i n sub k uh, is equal to one. So this means each of the n k all right, k equal one, two, three, and so on, has either it is a prime itself or as a prime factor. And each one of these is either a prime or has a prime factor. that is different from all others. Other n sub k. But there are infinitely many k's in here since there are infinitely many k's There are infinitely, this implies there are infinitely many primes. Infinitely many primes. Again, a very nice proof. Unfortunately, I missed it out a little bit. Okay. Uh, the last part of this is to give an estimate, okay, an hour bound for the nth prime. 
So I'm going to actually be brief in here on this coming plate. All right. So here it is. Let's have the theorem. Let P sub N be the nth prime in the sequence of prime numbers then we have two conditions, two properties that we define is 1 p n plus 1 is less than or equal to the product p1, p2, and so on up to p n plus 1. And another estimate, and we're going to see kind of the uh, advantages and disadvantages. P n is going to be this number equal 2 to the power 2 to the power n minus 1. Alright, the first estimate we have upper bound, it tells us that the n plus 1, it is smaller than all the product of the primes up to the nth one plus one. This is a nice estimate. The only problem with it, we need to know all the primes. All right, for this upper bound is actually given in terms of the primes before this n to plus one prime. However, this is an estimate that does not depend on the primes. It is given by this. The only problem with this, it is this is very, very bad or rough estimate. So for example, if you wanted to uh, talk about the fifth prime, all right, what's the fifth prime? Two, three, five, seven, eleven. So this is equal eleven, but according to this estimate, it's going to be less than or equal two to the power two to the power 5 minus 1. And this is 2 to the power 2 to the power 4. And as you can see, this is big, big number. However, if you do it from the first estimate, it's not that bad. Means in using this estimate, B5 is going to be less than or equal to 2 times 3, 5, 7, and this is it, uh, plus one, okay? A much better upper bound, but it requires to know all the primes up to the fourth prime, all right? Uh, let me see in here. Uh, the proof of the first one is straightforward. Actually, it does follow from Euclid's proof. Well, in Euclid's proof, we say that uh, if we have n primes, then when we take this expression, all right, this expression, this does not give me a prime. So okay, from the proof of Euclid's, Euclid's proof implies this. It is not a prime. So it means this implies it has a prime factor, at least one prime factor, has at least one prime factor. Now, if we has more than one prime factor, we take the smallest one of them. So if it has more, if there is more than one, if there is more than one, take the smallest. And we're going to find that the P n plus 1, so the p n plus 1 is going to be smaller than or equal to the smallest. 
And of course, this is less than or equal all of this number because uh, you know, and so so the smallest is the prime factor, uh, and that's going to be small. Well, uh, let me just briefly go over the proof of the second part of the theorem. And the proof is we use uh, actually strong induction. All right? So proof of 2, which is p to the n less than or equal 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1 by strong induction on n. So p1, the first prime is equal to 2, and the right hand side is going to be equal to 2, uh, 1 minus 1, this is 2, 2, the 2 to the 0 is 1, and this is equal to, and the statement is true. So P1 less than or equal to 2 to the 2, 1 minus 1. Okay? So let's assume that the, uh, this result is a true for 1, 2, for up to K. Okay, so we're going to use math induction. So let's assume that the statement or the inequality means statement is true for all the integers. One, two, three, and so on. So these are where k is bigger than or equal to one. All right. This means that p one is less than or equal to two to the power two to the uh, one minus one. Okay. And p two is less than or equal to two. Uh, 2 minus 1 and so up to p sub k is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 k minus 1. Alright? So we're going to assume all these are holes. These are true. And we need to consider p k plus 1. Alright? Now, by plot 1, we know this is less than or equal P1, P2, up to P, K, plus 1. This is from uh, part 1 of this theorem. Now we can use the, uh, this is less than or equal 2 to the power 2 to the 1 minus 1, which is basically 2 to the 0. Let me put it to the 0 in here. Then we're going to multiply this, the p sub 2 is 2 to the 2 to the 1, then 2 to the 2 to the second, and so on. And the last one is 2 to k minus 1 plus 1. Okay. All these powers of powers of 2. Now, we're going to look at this exponent. Okay, so let's look at just the top exponent. So I want to consider this top exponent. All right? Third of all, we can combine all of these together. Maybe I need to do one more. So this one is two. And then I'm going to be adding Square to the last one is 2 to the power k minus 1. Okay, and there is a plus 1 in it. Now, when I look at this sum, this is a geometric sequence or arithmetic progression. Uh, so, sorry, a geometric progression to the power 0 plus 2 to the 1, 2 squared plus 2 to the k minus 1. This, look it up, this is 2 to the k minus 1 over 2 minus 1. 
the common ratio is equal to 2, and this gives me 2k minus 1. Now, if I put this back in for that pk plus 1, we're going to prove that theorem for pk plus 1. So this is going to be less than or equal to, to this exponent. Okay, 2 to the power 2 k minus 1 in here. And I can also plus 1, there's another 1 in here. And I want to make this is less than or equal just to get the right stuff in here. I want to replace the, uh, this one by a number that is much bigger than that in general. So I'm going to replace this by this itself, which is true for any k bigger than or equal to 1, and this is a twice, 2 to the power k, uh, to the power 2, to the power k minus 1, and now I add the exponents again in here, all right, and I get the formula to actually hold for 2 to the k, all right. So in other words, we have this formula is it true. So this is true for k plus 1. By math induction, we are done. Uh, the formula for the inequality, rather, holds for all that. The inequality holds for all that. All right? Let's stop right here.